All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tawny Samiski. I am the Entomology Specialist with UMass Extension's Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program. And we wanna welcome uh, those of you who have attended before back, but also any newcomers to our Invasive Insect Webinar Series. Uh, this series is brought to you by UMass Extension's Landscape, Nursery, and Urban Forestry Program, as well as our Fruit Program. And it is made freely available to you thanks to uh, support through the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we are very grateful for, the, for their support. Now this morning I'm going to be doing a couple of introductions and do want to go over a bit about the pesticide and association credit process and then I will introduce today's topics and our speakers. So all of the instructions for receiving pesticide credit for Massachusetts categories 25, 27, 29, 35, 36, 48, <laughs> and the applicator's license, uh, as well as association credits. Um, and I forgot to add, there's a couple more that are applicable there in, the, in this list, uh, but those will be shared at the end of this webinar. So please be sure to remain on the webinar until the very end uh, in order to receive instructions about uh, the pesticide and association credits. Another thing for those of you who are interested in getting those credits, please make sure that you answer all of the poll questions that we will administer to you during these presentations. Some will happen during the presentations, other will, others will happen immediately after. Uh, you will not be graded on your responses to these poll questions, but uh, you must complete them in order to receive pesticide credit. So make sure that you are responding to those when the prompts come up in GoToWebinar and we'll try to guide you through that process. Again, make sure that you do not sign off early without answering the poll questions as you will not be awarded pesticide credit. And then for those of you who are just signing in, I will try to uh, put this in the chat again, but some of you may have already seen it, but uh, UMass Extension, because we are recipients of federal funding, uh, we are asked to provide certain demographic information uh, uh, to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is a survey that is 100% voluntary and 100% anonymous, uh, so you can skip the entire survey or any question that you feel uncomfortable answering, um, and your identity will not be collected uh, with this survey and your responses, and we cannot link those with your participation in this program. So uh, again, in a moment here, after I introduce our first speaker, I will send uh, this link in the chat once again, if, if anyone is not seeing that since you're, you're just joining us. Um, let's see, and with that, I think uh, the next thing I can do here is introduce our first speaker, and I will, before I do that, uh, invite him to share his screen, so hang on a second here. Uh, should be sending that invitation right now. And so we have here, and you can see on his webcam with us, uh, uh, Josh Bruckner. He is the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. And this morning he will be talking to us about spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts and the US. So without further ado, thank you, Josh, for being here and uh, have at it. All right, thank you, Tony. I'm gonna turn off my webcam so you can just focus on the, uh, the slide. But as Tony said, I'm gonna be discussing spotted lanternfly, which I'm sure most of you have heard of um, by now since it's, <clears throat> Been in the U.S. for some time now, and it's a pest of great concern in Massachusetts and uh, the United States. So we're going to jump right into it. <clears throat> and if you have questions, you should type them into the uh, the chat box, and I will answer them all at the end. So you can see a photo of it right up here on the screen. It's about a lanternfly. Its uh, Latin name is Lycorma delicatula. It is in the order Hem Hem Hemiptera, which makes it a true bug. So it is related to things like stink bugs, assassin bugs, um, aphids, um, true bugs all have a long piercing proboscis that they use to suck sap. So despite uh, its kind of broad wings uh, and somewhat resemblance to something like a moth, it is a true bug, it is closer to an aphid. 
Um, it has a whole lot of different hosts, um, including things like Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, Maple, Grapes, Apples, and Hops. And as you'll see later in the presentation, it has a very broad species list. It is a generalist, so um, it is not picky when it comes to, uh, to what it goes after, which is what makes it so difficult to, uh, to eliminate and what makes it such a species of concern. Uh, as with many of the invasive species we have in uh, the United States, it originates in uh, Eastern Asia because um, of our interconnected global economy. We have a lot of their pests and uh, they get a lot of ours. So you might think that those bright red wings it has makes this a very easy insect to identify, um, which isn't always the case. Um, it is fairly large. It is about um, you know up to an inch long, uh, sometimes even a little longer. Uh, the females are slightly bigger than the males. Um, and yes, they do have that brilliant red hind wing, which you can see in the bottom picture. Um, but as you know, oftentimes, as you can see in the photos on the right, when it's at rest, when it's feeding, uh, its wings are going to be folded, and it'll have that gray forewing um, over the top with kind of the mottled black coloration. Uh, and this makes it a little bit harder to identify. You can still kind of see the red hind wing uh, kind of peeking through the forewing. Uh, it's kind of like looks almost luminescent, which is sort of where it gets its. Uh, or could be where it gets its name from, the uh, lanternfly. Um, but that kind of mottled gray forewing gives it pretty decent camouflage, you'll see on the next slide. Uh, the sexually mature adults have uh, yellow banding on their abdomen, which you will see when the wings are flared like this. Um, and you will note that um, it does not have these very long prominent antenna the way a butterfly or a moth does, so that is another way you can distinguish them. Uh, those little orange nubs that you see on the photo on the bottom right are not its eyes or uh, you know, cheeks or anything. Those are its antenna. They're just very, very short. It's eyes with the little black dots above it. Uh, you can see another photo here, and you can see kind of how the camouflage works for the spotted lanternfly at rest. Uh, you can see how it blends in fairly well to the bark of uh, this tree or um, against the lichen. And uh, you might, you know, even though like the other photos were of individual lanternflies, you can start to see with this one here on the right um, how there can be very many of them. And this is why it ends up being a species of, of such concern because uh, it really swarms in large numbers. Uh, and this is a close up of the proboscis. As I said, it has a piercing sucking mouth part. It's got this long proboscis that, you know, when it's not in use, it's tucked between the legs, but then other times it, when it's in use, it'll stick out and be injected right into the plant or the tree. Um, I don't think you're, if you ever come across a lanternfly, you might not be this close to it, but it gives you a, another angle and another good sense of kind of what we're looking for and how it feeds from trees. These are all different look-alike species of the spotted lanternfly. Um, this, uh, image has been produced by the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, and we are working on having a similar one for Massachusetts. So you can see it compared to native uh, insects or things that are more common in Massachusetts. Um, but certain, certain things like, you know, the tiger moth, uh, the leopard moth, certainly um, you'll definitely find here in Massachusetts. Um, things like the box elder beetle um, have sometimes been confused with the spot and lanternfly. Um, but these are good insects to keep in mind. Um, that people will sometimes confuse for the spotted lanternfly. So it's kind of is helpful to have a repertoire of lookalikes so you know how to identify something if someone comes to you or you find something that you think might be a spotted lanternfly. As I said, they originate in East Asia. As you can see on the map, the, um, the countries highlighted in red um, are the lanternfly's native range, um, parts of China and uh, Vietnam. They, uh, they have been introduced to other parts of East Asia, including Korea in 2004, I believe, and to Japan. And then you can see also the Eastern United States, they have been introduced there. Um, we'll discuss the ways in which the Atlanta fly can be moved around later, but uh, the eggs certainly are uh, one way that they can be moved uh, across oceans or across you know, vast distances. And in their native range of Asia, there are some parasitic wasps or other insects that keep them in check, which we at the moment do not have here. We don't really have any predators that recognize spotted lanternfly in the United States. So it's one reason they are growing out of control. So they are first discovered in the United States in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. That's around the Philadelphia area. Um, they've probably been introduced as early as 2012. 
um, because it was a bit of a population already when they were discovered. Most likely they had arrived through uh, egg masses that were on a shipment of paving stone that was sent to a garden center in Pennsylvania, uh, which point the eggs were able to hatch after they'd been shipped from overseas and were able to spread to uh, throughout the state and then further. At this point, spotted lanternfly has been found in 26 different Pennsylvania counties. Uh, there's quarantines that have been enacted and they spread to some neighboring states as well. So this is a pretty fast growing insect. You'll see kind of what the range looks like. This from 2018, this survey map shows you all the different parts of Pennsylvania where they had surveyed for the spotted lanternfly. And uh, keep in mind, this is four years after they had first discovered the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. You can see all the positive finds, the red dots around the Philadelphia area. And they've surveyed throughout the state, but at that point in time, they had not found them much beyond um, the southeast part of the state. Flash forward to early 2020. The Orange Counties are the places where they originally had the earlier quarantines. You can see Berks County and several surrounding ones were all part of the quarantine. And then the Blue Counties were added in 2020. So you can see it spreads further out into the state into some surrounding counties and towns, and then all the way out into the western part of the state near Pittsburgh. Um, this must this was almost surely through um, through human means, kind of like accidentally transporting the insect further. And if we zoom out a little bit geographically, we can see all the different parts of the Northeast where they have found a spotted lanternfly. It's, you know, beyond Pennsylvania, it's been it's spread to um, counties in nearby New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia, up into New York and Connecticut, and all the purple dots in Ohio as well. That, that Ohio find was in uh, the end of 2020 in, I think, December. And the purple dots that are spread throughout the map are all the places where lanternfly have been found, but uh, there's no um, established breeding population. But in just you know, just since 2014, this is quite a quite a bit of a ways for this insect to have spread. So you can kind of get a sense of how quickly this insect can spread, and you'll see when combined with how damaging it can be to the environment, um, why it's something we're taking so seriously. So if you remember those photos of the insect uh, of its proboscis up close, um, you know it is a sap sucker, and that is what it does to plants. Um, so it uses that proboscis to pierce into plants, uh, you know the leaves or um, the stems, or um, right into the bark of the tree, the trunks of a tree on uh, with the adults. And they do not, they cannot ingest 100% of the sap that they are um, feeding off of. Um, so they are excreting some sap and uh, the digested material. It's, a, it's a, a waste called honeydew. It's a very sticky, sweet substance full of all these sugars. And that's going to run down the, um, down the tree and, on, and the leaves and it's gonna gather on the ground. And that's gonna do two things. One, it's going to promote the growth of uh, sooty mold. You can see in the photos, the, the white fuzzy stuff and the black substance on the ground. Uh, it's the sooty mold growing um, and that sooty mold's gonna you know, create these dead zones where things can't grow. Um, it's also going to attract other nuisance insects like ants, wasps, um, bees, hornets that are going to feed off of that uh, that honey and all the sugars. So what happens then is you've got you've got a tree that's covered in sticky sweet substance in mold. There's going to be mold all over the ground, over whatever plants you're growing there. There's lanternfly swarming everywhere. And there's other insects swarming everywhere. It's not going to be very pleasant. And you'll see this is, uh, again, this is the honeydew that's gathered on a grapevine or a grape leaf. Um, this is an, uh, a favorite host species of the spotted lanternfly. Uh, and that honeydew is going to get not just on plants or the ground, it's going to get anywhere, anywhere that's underneath where the insect is feeding. In this case, uh, someone's back porch, this kind of disgusting, sticky substance all over um, someone's steps. And, you know, you can imagine this getting on things like sidewalks, someone's um, lawn furniture, on a car that's parked underneath the tree, the side of a building, pretty much anything. Um, and once again, when this insect has an established population, it's going to swarm in huge numbers, as you can see here. This is a silver maple in someone's backyard. You can see the ring of sooty mold all over the grass. Um, that grass is all dead. Um, 
And this insect just swarms in huge numbers. So this is becoming not just a environmental pest, it is definitely an aesthetic burden as well and pretty disgusting. Um, and to kind of give you an idea of how serious the swarming is, I'm gonna show you this video taken from one of the quarantined areas of Pennsylvania. Take a look. So that's what they're dealing with in Pennsylvania, and that's the situation we are trying to avoid uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so we are ready for our first poll question. So that's going to go up on your screen momentarily. Thank you, Josh. And I forgot to introduce this morning also Jeffrey Jouet, who is here helping with the technical aspects of GoToWebinar and uh, he's helping to administer this poll question. So please, as soon as you uh, see that up on your screen, which you should be now, anybody who is looking for pesticide credit, please answer this poll question. And we invite everybody participating today to answer the poll question. I can see we have a, almost 80% of people answering, so we're just going to give a little bit more time to allow folks to get their answers in. You have 10 seconds to answer the question if you have not. The question, the poll question is closed and I uh, wanna share the results. 71% of people checked number one, Subsecting 70%, uh, interior tree damage five, all the above 30. So uh, I think the first two were the correct answers. Okay, um, so we're going to go on to the just go on to the next part of the presentation. So as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, Spot and lanternfly is a generalist, which means it has a huge number of species. Um, its main host species is the tree of heaven, which you might know as a nuisance invasive plant. Unfortunately, this is not the only host species um, for spot and lanternfly. It can also go after apple trees, uh, stone fruit trees like plums, peaches, cherries, and apricots, grapes, maple trees, all variety. Um, they do seem to like silver maple and red maple, uh, black walnut and a whole bunch of others, things such as birch, hops, beech, linden, aspen, black gum, London plane trees and sycamores, which are pretty common uh, shade trees or trees planted in parks, sassafras, willows, china berries, pears, blueberries, roses, all kinds of roses, including multiflora rose. It is a total of about 70 different species that the lanternfly can feed off of. So I'm going to highlight Tree of Heaven here because, as I said, this is the main host of spotted lanternfly. It, um, given a wide choice of different trees and plants to feed off of, it will prefer to go after the Tree of Heaven. Although um, we know now that it is not essential for the life cycle of spotted lanternfly, so they can, you know, do just fine if they do not have access to Tree of Heaven. But it again is the one they will go to most. Which means if you are trying to survey an area for signs of spotted lanternfly, um it can be a good idea to start by surveying Tree of Heaven to see if you can find them. 
So its Latin name is Ailanthus altisma. You might know this species just as Ailanthus rather than Tree of Heaven. Um, it is also a non-native species. Uh, it was introduced to, the, uh, to North America in 1784. And at the time it was considered a exotic and very wonderful species um, due to its hardiness. It's um, kind of different looking leaves, um, you know, the big palm frond shaped leaves. Um, and it was planted in a lot of very urban cities and urban areas in the United States. A lot of native trees were torn up to be replace the tree of heaven. Of course, now people consider it a nuisance because it, um, you know, it's very hard to get rid of. It can grow via cloning through the root suckers. Um, it grows very readily in disturbed areas, which, you know, while, you know, might be good if you're trying to cultivate it on purpose, it does mean it can show up in places like parking lots, the sides of roads, and uh, railways unintentionally. Um, if you don't want to, it just, you know, if you, you know, cut it down, if the roots remain, it'll spring up again. Um, and it can produce a toxin in the roots that will uh, inhibit the growth of native plants, so it can outcompete them. So very difficult tree to get rid of. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like if it has a little more space to grow. Um, sure, a lot of you are pretty familiar with this. It can be a common site around Boston and other cities. Um, but some very quick ID tips. Um, you know, it's got these thick kind of knobbly twigs with a shield-shaped leaf scar. These big um, compound leaves. Um, this entire thing right here is one leaf, and these individual little leaflets are, you know, just part of the leaf. Um, growing these palm frond shapes, um, and it's got these very distinct, um, the samaras, that, that is the fruit it produces to protect the seeds. They kind of look like what you'd find on an ash tree, these kind of like paddle-shaped uh, papery fruits. And then you gotta turn orangey and brown um, late summer and going into fall, and the tree will hold on to them even after it's lost its leaves. Um, a good winter ID tip, and throughout the rest of the year that I find is um, you look at the texture of the bark, it kind of has this ridged pattern like the skin of a cantaloupe. Um, this is usually what I look for first, um, you know, before I look at the leaves or anything else. Um, also, if you crush the leaves or the twigs, it has a distinct smell. It's, people have described it as being like rancid peanut butter. It's, it's got a very off-putting, strong smell. So if you're in doubt, that's one way you can check. Um, again, though, because lantern fly goes after a lot of different plants, not just tree of heaven. Um, there's a lot of different industries and parts of the economy that are at risk. Um, you think back to that video of the lantern fly swarming all of those those trees, and you can think of all the different things that uh, are threatened by lantern fly. Fruit growers, um, especially the grape, the apple, the uh, stone fruit industry are all at risk. This would include um, vineyards and pick your own apple orchards, which we have a lot of in Massachusetts. Um, different Agricultural products used in the production of alcohol, hops, um, apples, grapes, uh, used for making beer, wine, and cider. These industries are also at risk of taking a, an economic hit from the lanternfly. Um, hardwood and logging, um, trees such as black walnut, which can be common in uh, in lumber and uh, wood making, are at risk from lanternfly. Nurseries and garden centers. Um, all the, the products that they sell there, as well as even just non-host stocks, such as, you know, paving stone, lawn furniture, uh, potting materials. These can all harbor the lanternfly and their eggs and, um, you know, shipping materials, things like Christmas trees from giant growing centers to nurseries um, across the state or across state lines. Um, you can risk moving the lanternfly from one place to the other. So a lot of ways this thing can spread. Uh, an estimate from Pennsylvania um, from a paper called, and I've highlighted it right there so you can look it up if you would like the, uh, the nitty gritty details, uh, a paper called The Potential Economic Impact of the Spotted Lanternfly on Agriculture and Forestry in Pennsylvania by Jason K. Harper et al. You can uh, look at extent the uh, Pennsylvania uh, State Extension website or look up Jason K. Harper for more details. Um, this study estimated that uh, 2,800 jobs and at least $42.6 million of the Pennsylvania economy are threatened annually by the spotted lanternfly. Well, obviously, that number in terms of jobs and economic loss would be different for Massachusetts, um, but it gives you a sense of the scale that we're, we're at here. We're not talking about just kind of a nuisance pest. We're talking about you know millions of dollars lost per year if this insect is not um, effectively curtailed and dealt with. 
to kind of give you an idea visually of what that economic impact or agricultural impact looks like, um, we can see the lanternfly swarming some agricultural products. You'll notice they're not going after the fruit themselves, but like uh, unlike something like the stink bug, which sucks the sap directly from the apples themselves. Spawn lanternfly is going after the grapevine and the apple tree. And yes, it is going to get sooty mold and uh, honeydew all over the fruit, which makes them unsellable. But the greater risk here is um, loss of plant. So spinal lanternfly does not directly lead to the death of the plant itself, but it's going to severely weaken it and repeated feedings over a long period of time or in a very heavy infestation, as in this vineyard here, um, might lead to the plant becoming so sick it just dies off or something else kills it or the plant's just going to you know, not be viable anymore. So a lot of vineyards in Pennsylvania where they saw it, have, they have seen huge um, infestation of spotted lanternfly, have lost you know, up to maybe 70% of their grapevines. So this is hugely economically devastating for individual vineyards and then for the, um, for the fruit industry in Pennsylvania in general. We're gonna talk about the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly because that has not been done yet. I've only really shown you what the adults look like. Uh, this is an insect that goes through what's called incomplete metamorphosis, which means it does not have a pupil stage like a, a beetle or a butterfly will, uh, but it has several nymph instars. So the eggs hatch uh, after a certain number of growing degree days, usually in late May, early June, um, from which emerges a very, very tiny black nymph, and it goes through four different instars, each one getting larger and larger until the final instar is red with white spots, pretty distinct looking. From about July through September is when they complete their metamorphosis into the adult. Uh, the adults die off at the first hard frost, but before that they are going to seek out a mate, they're going to lay eggs, and the egg masses survive over winter. Um, and that is what carries on through the, to the spring when they hatch and continue the life cycle. These are some photographs, you can see what the nymphs look like uh, in real life. You can see them, they're you know, a little bit smaller than the adults, and. Uh, kind of what, the, what they look like swarming in large numbers. Um, and important to note is that these, this insect has a proboscis in all its life stages, so it can do damage to plants um, even as a freshly hatched nymph. Now, its proboscis is much smaller and not as strong as when it's an adult, so it can't go after the same kinds of plants. In its earlier life stages as you know, early instar nymphs, it's going to go after either the leaves and stems of plants, the very, very soft succulent parts, maybe the leaves of a, a tree of heaven or a cherry tree, um, or they're gonna go after plants like roses. Roses of rose plants are a great indicator of early life stage presence because um, there's so many parts of the rose plant that are very soft and easy for the, uh, the nymph to feed off of. And as the insect gets older, it's going to show preference for its preferred host trees like Tree of Heaven, and its proboscis at that point is strong enough to pierce right through the bark, so it's not just going to be on the leaves, but it can be anywhere on the tree, certainly on the trunk, as we saw in those that video earlier. It's another photograph to kind of show you the comparison of the size from the very, very tiny early instar nymph developing, getting larger, sometimes it's confused for like a tick or a spider in its earliest life stages because of its general size and shape. But you'll notice, of course, it has um, six legs instead of eight. Um, the egg masses are important to focus on because again, this is a way that the insect can spread and it's also um, how the insect propagates. You'll notice in all the photos how good this egg mass is at camouflaging. So on the photo on the right, you can see these little connected oval-shaped seed-like apparatuses. This is the actual egg themselves, and the female will generally cover them with a putty-like substance. You can see in the photo on the left what that looks like, and on the right when it's dried. Um, when it's fresh, it's kind of like a gray mud-like substance, and when it's older, it's going to get dried and cracked, and it's pretty well camouflaged against a variety of surfaces, including uh, the bark of a tree. Uh, rock, a lot of different things. The females can lay up to two egg masses per season, about 30 to 50 eggs each, uh, and then they will, the females die off again with the first hard frost. But the but the eggs can survive through the cold. Um, there's uh, There have been studies out of Pennsylvania that show that the eggs are still viable even if temperatures hit like negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but um, as long as there's enough growing degree days, you know, enough warm days, the eggs will hatch and still be viable. You can see some more photos of the eggs just to kind of give you a sense of scale. And the eggs are often laid in protected places like the underside of a picnic table here, or like under this little ridge on a, uh, a barrel. Um, underside of a branch maybe or trunk of a tree and bark. And you can see again how well camouflaged they are against weathered wood on bark right here as well. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence that they prefer rusted metal such as you know a train car or maybe a rusty rain barrel underside of a vehicle. I don't think there's any evidence that shows that this is statistically significant, it's anecdotal, but you they are very indiscriminate. We have found their egg masses on, th on a huge variety of things. This photo out of Pennsylvania from their um, spot of flight checklist shows all the places they have found egg masses. Light bulbs, um, cushions that go on lawn furniture, including the underside of those cushions, um, fence posts, abandoned tires, um, people's outdoor camping equipment, firewood, um, bottom of a planching box that maybe you're not looking for. Um, pretty much any flat surface, these are, you're going to find these. And that's why you can see all the different ways this insect can so easily spread. You know, it might be very easy for a lantern fly to lay its eggs um, and on some firewood and like, you know, it's kind of tucked away under these logs so you can't see it. And then just shipping that firewood to a different state is going to help spread that insect around. A lot of different situations um, and ways this insect can propagate. Another photo that kind of shows a good close-up of the egg masses. Again, they don't have that covering, but you can see what they look like when the nymphs freshly hatch. They uh, haven't, their exoskeletons haven't hardened yet, and you can see the holes from the hatched eggs. Obviously, these ones were not covered up by the female for whatever reason, but um, you know that is what they look like as well. Um, this photo here compares the spotted lanternfly egg masses on the left with a much more, what should be a much more familiar site, uh, the gypsy moth egg mass on the right. So you'll notice the difference between these two. The gypsy moth egg masses are um, kind of, they have a much different texture. They're sort of fuzzy, almost like moss or uh, something. Um, they generally are more like tan, yellowish or buff colored compared to kind of the grayish color of the spotted lanternfly egg masses. And uh, gypsy moth egg masses often have these, you can see these little tiny pin prick holes in them. That is from a parasitic uh, wasp um, that has been introduced that can sometimes parasitize the gypsy moth egg masses. Um, so even though gypsy moths do tend to lay their eggs in similar places, like the underside of tree branches and protected areas where they can be protected from the elements, they look pretty different. So make sure you, you know, can teach people about the difference between the two of those. Uh, and we have another poll question, um, so I am going to let Jeff take over. So the question is up. Please uh, answer the question. Ten seconds and the question will close. Question is closed and that's the results. Three percent said Mabel, and ninety-seven percent saying Tree of Heaven. So Tree of Heaven is the correct answer. All right, uh, move right along. So we're gonna talk a bit more about how this insect can spread. Um, you know, I've alluded to how mobile this insect is. Um, and certainly through hitchhiking, through the, you know, the adults or the, the nymphs hitchhiking and the egg masses, this is 
most effective way to send second spread. Um, it is a plane hopper. So um, the adults, of course, have wings and they can fly. Um, they're not as you know efficient a flyer as something like a you know a moth or some other kind of beetle, a cicada certainly. Um, they kind of tend more to glide, um, though they can you know fly a short distance under their own power. Um, so most of the way they do spread around is through human intervention. That would be the adults, uh, the nymphs, hitching a ride on some shipped material or the side of a vehicle or um, other a train or something uh, and the eggs being laid on basically any flat surface as you know you saw all the different things those eggs can be found on very easy for those infested materials to be shipped across state lines to a new place um you remember that tiny quarantine on the western side of pennsylvania probably some they got they got shipped out of the quarantine in the eastern half of the state tree of heaven can also form these natural pathways that help the spotted lanterfly move from one place to the next. So a lot of different ways this insect can be spread around. So vehicles. So places like Pennsylvania are of course aware of this. Um, and they put out these promotional literature to remind people to, you know, check or spot a lanternfly, check on their vehicles before they leave. Um, if they're in a quarantined area of the state, make sure that they check their car and any of the things they have in the car, make sure they're not moving it to new places. And you can see how how you can imagine how easy it is for someone who's like, you know, Josh, uh, I believe your audio has gotten interrupted. Yes. Okay, there you go. I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of different ways this insect can be accidentally moved around through vehicles. Um, something like the you know lanternfly falling on someone's shoulder and being um, you know brought into the cab of a vehicle. Um, this is an actual photo taken in September last year of lanternfly on Joe Biden's shoulder when he's giving a talk in. Delaware, so pretty easy for this insect to hitch a free ride somewhere. Um, this can also happen on trains. Um, so again, um, pallets of goods that are loaded onto trains can get shipped to new places. Um, and tree of heaven, as I said, can grow in disturbed areas such as the sides of train tracks. Um, you might have whole stretches of train of train track um, or highway that go from along interstates or from one place to the other. Um, and if the entire length is lined with tree of heaven, the laner fly can kind of jump from one tree to the next and kind of move along pathways that way. You might also have a situation where um, a freight train is parked um, on a side rail for several days or a week while it's loaded up with goods to be shipped somewhere. And if there's a bunch of tree of heaven growing near that track, um, that gives the laner fly that might be feeding on that tree ample time to kind of move from the tree to the train or to the pallets of goods and can move somewhere else. So you're starting to see all the different actors that can be involved in um, moving this insect around, but also in controlling it. So a lot of different, you know, moving companies, trucking companies, shipping companies, rail, railway companies are all places that we've reached out to, nurseries, people in the green industry. These are all different groups that need to be aware of land or fly because they can unintentionally be involved in moving it uh, to new places. So this is a great thing to kind of teach people about. Uh, I'm showing you this map again just so you can have a little more time to kind of take a close look at it. Um, but also so we can focus on the spread in Massachusetts. So of course, um, remember the spot lantern fly started in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, it has shown up in Massachusetts a few times. The first time was in Boston in 2018. A potted poinsettia plant that was sent from a, a, a greenhouse or a garden center in the quarantine in Pennsylvania got sent up to Boston. The adult was already dead at the time, but that was our first find of lanternfly in Massachusetts. So we put out a pest, we put out an alert, we kind of let people know that this it is possible for this insect to get here. And then in 2020, we had a lot more finds. Um, 
they again these there's no viable breeding population in massachusetts as far as we're aware there are trapping and survey efforts to see if we can find anything um but as far as we know all of the lanternfly found in massachusetts have been shipped in from pennsylvania or other quarantines um but we have found this insect in um now in bilrica concord milford norwood and sharon and those finds are all from 2020. um so you know we're finding them a lot more frequently now and in 2020 as well the lanternfly we found vi viable populations in uh that county in Connecticut, uh, parts of New York, in Ohio. So um, this insect is spreading quickly. Um, it is certainly viable uh, in Massachusetts. It might take a little longer for the eggs to hatch um, compared to Pennsylvania. Um, and they are cold limited to an extent, um, but I think you'd have to go very, very far north where there are much fewer growing degree days for those eggs to not be viable. Um, and this map here shows you the potential distribution of lanternfly throughout the United States. The red is kind of where there's a very high probability, and then the cooler colors, you know, not as suitable. Um, of course, you'll see all the places where lanternfly has already been found, like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, it are viable. Massachusetts is viable as well. The Midwest is certainly viable. So, you know, it could certainly spread from Ohio out west. And you'll notice California is highlighted as well, which is something of great concern given how robust the um, agricultural industry is in California and how much they export things to other states. And uh, when you know it, they have found spotted lanternfly in California. Again, there's no established population there, so um, there's no eggs or there's nothing, there's no need for a quarantine at the moment, but um, as with Massachusetts, it was a population that was accidentally shipped in from the Pennsylvania quarantine, in this case on a cargo plane. The insects were dead by the time they landed in uh, Sacramento. But it again is an example of how easily this insect can spread around uh, unintentionally through human methods. Uh, now the last thing I want to cover is the management strategies. There are several different strategies used by the states to control the spread a spot of lanternfly, it's not all, you know, kind of helpless. Um, so some of the most common methods are things like egg scraping, tree banding, host removal, um, chemical treatments, trap trees, biocontrols. So we're gonna go into those in a little more detail. Egg scraping is just like it sounds like, um, you know, some people might try and use some more extreme methods like, you know, power washing or flamethrowers to get rid of the egg masses. Um, there's absolutely no need for something that extreme. All you have to do is take a stick or a credit card or a, um, an ID card, such as uh, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources produces and distributes for free. Um, just scrape the eggs off of the tree or wherever you find them into a container of rubbing alcohol that kills the eggs and prevents them from growing. Uh, and it's definitely a good idea to do that in the winter or the cold months after the adults have died off. Um, so there won't be any new eggs laid and the eggs haven't hatched yet. So this is a great time you know, to check for egg masses and get rid of whatever you find. Uh, tree banding is the application of a sticky tape around the bark of a tree, uh, something where you know the eggs are. And again, once those eggs hatch, the nymphs are going to crawl up the tree. They're going to be looking for the soft succulent leaves or parts of the tree to feed from and being wingless, they can't fly around that tape. So you're gonna catch a lot of different insects and uh, lanternflies that crawl up the tree. Uh, with a very heavy infestation, this has limited utility. You're gonna have to replace the tape often. And sometimes wire mesh has to be employed to kind of uh, prevent other animals like birds and squirrels from being stuck on the tape. So this is simple, but uh, can be effective method that's been used by uh, Pennsylvania and other states before. Um, there are a lot of chemical treatments, uh, pesticides, injections, uh, soil drenches that have been researched by Pennsylvania. We're not at the point in Massachusetts yet where any sort of chemical treatment is being considered, um, but states with heavy infestations have been sort of testing to see what is most useful. Um, a trap tree uses a combination of uh, chemical treatments and hosts to sort of help reduce the population of lanternfly. As you can see in this illustration, what will happen is the majority of the tree of heaven in an area will be eliminated. The remaining ones are treated with a chemical injection to make them toxic. The 
any spotted lanternfly in the area will swarm those remaining tree of heaven since as again it is their preferred host they will feed off of those trees and um, the chemical injection will kill them so you can see how effective this is this is from uh, Pennsylvania you can see the the sooty mold growing all over the ground but you can see all those dead lanternfly that have fed off that tree of heaven and um, so this seemed to work pretty well uh, biocontrols are something that are always asked about since it's a kind of a non-chemical way to control an invasive population. Um, and native predators such as spiders or wasps are going to have a limited impact on the population of spotted lanternfly. Um, so you can't rely on, you know, just whatever we have here to sort of completely stop the spread of lanternfly. There are parasitic wasps, as you can see in this picture here. Um, from China that are being studied to see if they are effective controls. Obviously with a biocontrol, um, this has been studied with Emerald Ash 4 where they are looking into biocontrols. You want to make sure that you have something that um, only goes after the host species in question and won't target any other native insects. There's some evidence that the gypsy moth parasitoid that has been released um, targets the fly to a very small extent. And there are two native fungi that Coa Major and Buvera bassiana that do affect spotted lanternfly. Native insects have a um, evolutionary resistance to this fungi as they co-evolved with them. Spotted lanternfly does not. So this can be um, you know, an effective way to control the um, to control the lanternfly. So a lot of different methods available here for biocontrols. Um, nothing that's kind of widely used or distributed yet, but again. Biocontrols do take some time to research, um, make sure they're efficient. Quarantines are of course used, and, you know, you saw that map earlier of all the states, all the, the highlighted blue areas or the red lines are where they have quarantines in place to control the spread of lanternfly. Obviously the quarantines are not perfectly effective, but um, it does try and encourage people to not move materials out of those quarantines. Um, it restricts movement of things such as firewood, brush, grapevines, host material, nursery stock. Um, companies that work within the quarantine or that do business in the state or in other places often have to undergo compliance training. Um, as you can see, you know, Penn State Extension and New Jersey both make use of this. Um, so any business like a nursery or a trucking company has to make sure they are undergoing training so they are aware of the risks of lanternfly, how to deal with it, and you know what to do if they find something. Um, outreach and awareness programs such as this, and webinars and presentations, trainings are important because kind of the more people know about spotted lanternfly, what it looks like, what its eggs look like, how to report it, what to do if they find one, can help prevent the spread. We only have you know states have a limited amount of resources, so the more the public is aware. Um, the more engaged they are, the better of a chance we have of finding an infestation early, especially in something like in a place like Massachusetts, where um, you know all the reports that we have had so far of lanternfly have come from people who have gone to our website, they've filled out our form, they've sent in pictures of either what they think is a lanternfly or an actual lanternfly that they have found. So eyes on the ground, um, public awareness is a great way to um, to help deal with this uh, this insect. For states like New York and Pennsylvania that have some more resources and funds available, they have some fancier methods of detection, such as drone survey. You know, so in New York here, they're surveying um, some cargo that maybe just came into the state, see if they can find any signs of the lanternfly and its eggs on any of these goods. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, they are making use of uh, lanternfly sniffing dogs. So just as you can train a dog to detect the presence of a bomb or narcotics, um, you can train them to smell for the presence of an invasive insect. They've done this with Asian longhorn beetle and now they're doing spotted lanternfly. They can smell what the egg masses are like and kind of see if they can find any. Um, it's expensive to train a lanternfly sniffing dog, many, I think $35,000 to train one dog. So um, not really an option right now in Massachusetts, but Pennsylvania has made use of this in the past, as you can see here. Um, so what can you as, you know, someone taking this, this webinar do? Um, so by educating yourself, you're taking the first step. You should make sure that 
you are speaking to other people that you know, um, friends, coworkers, neighbors, to make sure that they are aware of the spotted lanternfly and the risks inherent to it, how it can move, what it looks like, how to identify it. Um, there's a lot of resources online from, um, especially from, uh, from MDAR, the Mass Department of Agriculture, from Pennsylvania's, uh, the Pennsylvania State Extension, um, that have materials, they have videos, um, a lot of different resources, educational resources. Um, make sure that you're not doing things like moving firewood, which can harbor a lot of different invasive species. Um, make sure you're checking for the adult lanternfly, um, for the egg masses, you know, know when each life stage is going to be present at which time of year. Um, you can make use of materials such as um, the ID cards, which you can see in the bottom of that screen. And uh, MDAR has also produced other materials such as um, fact sheets, uh, posters to raise awareness, checklists, um, and best managements and practice that we've produced specifically for the nursery industry. So um, if you go to our website, um, massnrc.org slash pests, um, right down there. Um, you can order materials, but also importantly, that website, massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF, uh, is where you will report anything that you find. If you think you have found a lanternfly, that is where you'd go. You can upload pictures that you take. Um, we take all the reports very seriously. So even if you or someone else is not quite sure that's a lanternfly, but you think it might be, you would want to go there and report it. So please keep this website in mind. Um, and report anything you find. At this point, it's time for our last poll question. Thank you, Josh. And I can see some folks are already answering. So please, as a reminder, make sure you respond and answer this poll question, especially if you are looking for pesticide and association credits. Looks like we have about 80, or excuse me, 90 folks responding, or 90% of the folks responding. So if anyone needs to answer this, please do so quickly. So I'm sure Jeffrey will want to close this out soon. In five seconds, I'll close the question. Questions closed, and uh, so uh, ninety percent got the got the correct answer, and nine percent did not. So the correct answer is drop it or collect, assemble, and report it to MDR. That was the correct answer. All right, that's that's the whole presentation. So at this point, I am going to answer. Any questions that anyone had throughout the course of the presentation? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Josh. That was fantastic. A lot of good information in a short period of time. Uh, and speaking of which, I believe you may have answered a lot of the questions that have been coming in throughout the webinar, but a couple here. Um, I know you shared information about getting, uh, uh, for example, a, a data card or informational uh, card um, or more supplies from MDAR. And Jan asks, uh, specifically for Connecticut residents, can they also ask for these materials from uh, MDAR? Um, so we don't ship materials out of state, but a lot of the materials we have, um, like the, the you know the PDFs, can be downloaded and printed. Um, we variety cards. We you know we might be able to make exceptions, but certainly on our website, a lot of those materials can be printed right off. Um, things like the the mini posters, which are great for the mini posters. I didn't don't have a picture of it here, but they have a, a QR code, so you can display them in a place to kind of let people know about Lanterfly and they can just use the QR code to go right to our fact page. 
Excellent, thank you. Let's see here. Um, uh, another question from Norman. What are the specific restrictions for movement of logs from quarantined areas with regard to distance? Can you speak to that or provide him with information about where he can get more information? Uh, about distance? Um, you might, you'd probably want to find like a, a specific study or scientific paper that talks about that. I'm you might be able to find something more on uh, UPenn Extension's website. They have some pretty good resources there. Um, I don't know of a specific study off the top of my head, um, although I know there have been some that have studied like the flight patterns of lanternfly. I did, there was a webinar I saw recently about that uh, and the name of the author escapes me, but there have been studies, so it is available somewhere online. Thank you, and I also mentioned to Norm that I think if you're looking for specifics to quarantine requirements, uh, those will be state specific for areas that do have established populations, and so you should probably contact that particular state's Department of Agriculture or corresponding agency. I've got another question here from David. Uh, how is SLF monitored outside of an infested area? Do you check Ilanthus or are there any effective traps or lures? Um, traps and lures are used to sort of monitor the presence of lanternfly. We've, MDAR and uh, our CAPS program have used some to sort of see where Lanternfly have showed up. Um, there's things called circle traps that I know are used in Pennsylvania to kind of trap lanternfly, although there might be a matter of more you know, presence rather than trying to uh, eliminate the population. I'm not sure what chemicals are used precisely. I think that there's still some research being done by uh, UPenn uh, to see kind of what the most effective lures are. Um, but there are some, you know, there are things being studied. It's not just all, you know, sticky tapes and like things like that and kind of hoping for the best. Thank you, Josh, and I'll use this as an opportunity to put in a plug for folks to return on February 9th. Uh, one of the topics will be uh, regarding spotted lanternfly monitoring and testing airborne attractants for early detection. So uh, keep that on your agenda for February 9th as well. Um, let's see if we have maybe time for one more question uh, before the break. And of course, a lot are coming in. Uh, let's see here. Sorry about the delay. Um, maybe more questions about management. Uh, where where can folks get more information with regard to managing spotted lanternfly? Um, managing tips again are probably going to be specific to each state, since each state's going to have its own set of rules and uh, suggestions. Pen, uh, UPenn Extension has some good best management practice guides for different industries. Um, MDAR has produced one for the nursery industry. Um, more specific guidelines from MDAR are forthcoming, I guess, dependent on how bad the lanternfly infestation gets that, I guess, is to be determined based on what we see in summer 2021. Um, but we, are, we will be constantly updating our website with guidelines but you know for now just kind of following these general guidelines that work for all invasive insects like don't move firewood um you know try not to if, if you're like a involved like in, in any sort of like shipping things make sure you're checking your materials uh for signs of land or fly that sort of thing excellent josh well thank you so much we really appreciate your time and all of this valuable information today thank you so much you're very uh, welcome thank you everyone for listening <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I am going to switch the screen for a moment here and hopefully I have my uh, PowerPoint up. We'll see if we can get this to work. Oh, sorry about the delay here, folks. We are going to take a a uh, quick 10 minute break. Actually, it's nine minutes now. So at 1110, I just want to make sure that everybody stays on this link and uh, uh, don't close out of GoToWebinar, but maybe stand up, um, you know, move your legs around, <laughs> uh, take a, a break for about the next nine minutes and come back to join us at 1110 for our next presenter, which will be a discussion about biological control of winter moth in Massachusetts. Uh, so again, stay with us and we will be right back.
Joe, we have a couple of minutes before we get started here. I was going to offer to have you share your screen and turn your webcam on and we can just get ready. All right, hang on a second. Let me uh, give you the prompt to share your screen. Oh, I cannot hear you currently, Joe. Let me see if you are muted. Uh, yes, let me unmute you. Hang on. Okay, now try speaking. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Okay, can now I let me. My screen, I can see myself. Let me see here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the control so you can also show your PowerPoint. Okay, so I guess. When when we go on stream, what we want to see is just me. Should I should I maximize this screen, or what should I do about that? Let's see. Um, so I can see you on your webcam, but if you also want to just get your title slide up there, um, perfect. This is the view we want for your introduction. Okay, but for my introduction, we just want to see me, right? Uh, this is fine. I can see you and I can see your title slide. You don't want me to do, uh, I mean, okay, fine, whatever. And we'll give, actually, it looks like we are exactly at 11.10 right now. So I will welcome everybody back and, um, and we'll get started with our next presenter. So I do want to introduce to all of you, Dr. Joseph Elkinton. He is a professor of entomology in the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and an expert on all things winter moth. And I'm so pleased and grateful to have him uh, talk to us today about the biology and biological control of winter moth uh, in, in New England. So Joe, please take it away. Okay, folks, well, it was nice to have you all on board. I've worked on many forest insects over my long career at UMass Amherst. I did the first third of it on gypsy moths, and I've been working in more recent years on other new invasives, hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer. But by far the most important project in the last 15 years has been the winter moth. So I have a, a nice story to tell you about winter moth. So I think we'll go right to the news, to the slides, and I'll tell you that story. I'll get rid of my... So here's the winter moth title. So I've been working on the, the population biology and the biological control of winter moth in New England. And winter moth, let me, I can operate my, uh, oh, hang on. There we go. Winter moth showed up in Massachusetts in the late 1990s when we heard about this uh, defoliating inchworm north and south of Boston in the late 1990s. And we assumed it was a native species. We have a number of native species like Bruce Spanworm, Fall Cankerworm, probably the most common one, occasionally causes defoliation. But those uh, outbreaks go away on their own. Those are native species. They have a good suite of natural enemies that bring them in the check and they're for the most part not a problem. Well, this, this outbreak was different because it didn't go away, it, it persisted. And then in, in December 20, 2002, we, we heard about this big flight of, of moths, little inchworm moths uh, at Christmas time. And that was uh, not something that any of our native species do. That's way too late. Winter moth is a native, it immediately suggested winter moth because winter moth is a well-known species in Europe in, in Europe, it's not really a problem for the most part, except in some areas. Uh, but um, it's called winter moth because it flies in December. And so that's what we suspected that. And we confirmed that with our taxonomical collaborators, Dave Wagner at UConn and Richard Hobecki at, um, at Cornell, who said, indeed, this is winter moth. Well, I was uh, actually excited to have the opportunity to work on winter moth because I knew First of all, that there was a famous example of biocontrol of winter moth in Nova Scotia. And so we had a chance of actually fixing the problem. But also, fund more fundamentally, um, it, winter moth has been a, a center of population ecology of work in Europe for many decades. There was this, this little book published when I was a graduate student by Varley, Gradwell, and Hassel, who did foundational work on insect population ecology uh, at Oxford University. And their main uh, 
subject of, of their studies was winter moth at, at, a, at a wood near Oxford University. So I knew all about winter moth, and it sub subsequently became a major problem in eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island, as indicated by all these headlines. Winter moth is a, a completely prolific species, meaning that it feeds on many, many kinds of tree species. Um, it, it loves oak trees, it loves maple trees. Here we see defoliated apple trees, and it became a big problem on blueberries. So many blueberry growers in eastern um, Massachusetts lost their entire blueberry crops for about a decade um, due to the winter moth. So winter moth feeds on almost any deciduous tree. This shows a Norway maple down on Cape Cod. Uh, completely defoliated by winter moth. Winter moth has occurs in huge numbers on these out, in these outbreak populations. We've estimated there's about a hundred thousand caterpillars per tree, and this shows these little green inchworms. We collect them by the tens of thousands, and that leaf tattering on the up in the upper left shows the kind of damage it. it um, it, the winter moth make little holes in the leaves, mainly because they they start feeding before the leaves even expand. So they're they're feeding on the bud tissue, and that leads to holes in the leaves. And defoliation is often not entirely complete, mainly because the winter moth finish feeding quite early. The, the, this all this defoliation happens in May. They're an early spring feeder, and they finish their life cycle as the larval stage in about May 20th. And so often they haven't completely consume the trees, but sometimes they do. So this goes over the reasons the life cycle. The eggs are uh, over in the upper upper uh, left here, are laid singly on the trees, unlike other insects that we've heard about, like the spotted lanternfly or gypsy moth, they are not an egg mass. The eggs are laid individually. Each female lays about 200 eggs. And uh, um, she these eggs hatch in, uh, early spring before the buds are even open, as the buds are starting to expand, the caterpillar was born to the buds, a lot of the damage happens before the, the leaves expand. And as I just said, larvae finish feeding in, in late May. There's a whole suite of uh, forest insects that do this. And the, the, the work in England showed that it, they do this because the, the larvae are taking advantage of the very high nitrogen compound uh, concentration of early spring foliage but also they're avoiding the tannin compounds that oak leaves uh, produce in to defend themselves against the foliators. And those, those tannin compounds build up later, later in the season. So the winter moths then drop to the ground underneath the trees and they burrow into the ground. That's this lower slide shows the pupa and they spin a little cocoon down in the soil beneath the tree. And that's where they stay all summer long. Um, and they, they emerge as adults, shown over here on the lower left, uh, in November and December. The, the females, shown here, have no wings. And that's true of many of our geometric species. And they, they do this because it allows them to devote all of their energy to egg production. They let the males do the flying. So even gypsy moths is like this. Gypsy moth females have wings, but they let the males do the flying. The gypsy moth females don't fly. So then the female produces a pheromone that um, attracts the males. They mate, and she then climbs the trees and lays the eggs. So there's one generation a year. So what did we do to, to, to take on this insect? Well, first we wanted to know, well, where is the winter moth? So we used pheromone baited traps uh, to su survey for winter moth. Um, Etymologists like me have used pheromones since the 1970s and 80s when all of the, the, um, the pheromones of uh, major forest and major insects of all kinds have, were identified with the help of biochemists. So this pheromone of winter moth was identified by Wendell Roloffs in 1982. It consists of a single compound shown over there on the right. And, but unfortunately, the winter moth pheromone is used also by the, the North, American, North American species, Bruce Manrum. It's, it's the close relative of winter moth here in North America. It almost never causes outbreak because it's under good biological control, but it uses the same pheromone. So then when we deploy these traps, the traps fill up with little brown moths, some of which are Bruce Manrum and some of which are winter moth. So the Bruce Manrum is out there, it's just not in high density population. This trap over here on the left the sticky trap that I hung down in down um, in the southeast Massachusetts 
when we first started, we used to stick them, stick them stuff on the trap. And this trap filled up. You can see all these moths flooded in. They come in by huge numbers to these pheromone uh, lures. And this trap filled up in about 15 minutes. Well, moths and sticky traps are, are difficult to deal with. So we quickly went to this high capacity trap. The pheromone uh, lure is placed right there. The moths fly in and they drop down to a funnel into this lower part where there's an insecticide that kills them. So you can build several hundred moths into these traps and they're all in good shape for subsequent study. All right. Well, this shows the Bruce Spammer and Winter, and, and winter Moth. And so, so you have a trap full of brown moths. You got to tell which ones are Winter Moth, which ones are Bruce Spammer. And that's not very easy. The, the, the wing patterning just doesn't cut it. This shows the variation of wing patterning just within Bruce Van Worm. You can't reliably distinguish between the two species by looking at the wing patterns. This shows the, the uh, winter moth pheroma, female again with, she had vestigial wings. She evolved from ancestors that did have wings, but she, she lost the ability to fly. Well, uh, many entomologists uh, use genitalia to distinguish species because the genitalia of many insects are quite distinct even though the rest of the body looks quite similar so that's true of these two species this is the winter moth geni male genitalia and the bruce man run. you can see they have slightly different shapes but they're not that different and my my poor lab tech jeff bettner spent many days gazing at the at the genitalia of these of these moths trying to distinguish between the two so we quickly realized that we should use dna to distinguish them, we use DNA barcoding. The, the so-called barcoding gene is a mitochondrial gene that's <clears throat> now been sequenced for, for many tens of thousands of insect species. It's the main gene that is used to identify insects nowadays, and it's, it's become relatively inexpensive to do this. So we did that. And then we surveyed, we put out the pheromone traps all over uh, New England and up into Canada. My technician, Jeff, uh, traveled up into New Brunswick, each one of these spots, the place where he hung a pheromone trap, and the red, then the red spots show where a recovered, recovered winter moth. The green ones are Bruce Van Worm. So we recovered winter moth from, from eastern Long Island up through Rhode Island, eastern Massachusetts, and into Nova Scotia. Well, we knew about Nova Scotia because winter moth had been in Nova Scotia since the 1930s. Um, well, uh, we were very surprised, and our colleagues in Maine were just as surprised and to discover we had they had winter moth right along the coast of Maine. No winter moth in the interior, but right along the coast they had winter moth. They didn't they'd never heard of winter moth. Well we right away realized that this uh, uh, this um, distribution well, winter moth matches the Massachusetts cold hardiness of the US cold hardiness maps uh, produced um, by the USDA so and tell people when to plant their crops based on minimum winter temperatures. I was very surprised to learn that Massachusetts uh, has very similar winter temperatures to Nova Scotia, even though so Nova Scotia is so far and much farther north, it's out here in the Gulf Stream. So the temperatures are the same. And as you can see, right along the coast of Maine, there's a little strip of land associated with the, with the, with the warmer ocean temperatures in the wintertime that are friendly to winter moths. And this also shows why winter moths came to Nova Scotia in the 1930s and basically never went anywhere because of much colder temperatures here in in um, New Brunswick and northern Maine prevented the westward spread. So this shows that winter moth distribution is linked to the winter temperatures. That's and but it also shows that further south, Pennsylvania and well all the Midwest. These are have winter temperatures that are very friendly to winter moths, and so this winter moth now represents now now has arrived in Massachusetts. It represents a major threat to the rest of the country. So over the next decade, winter moths started out north and south of Boston, as I showed in an earlier slide up here on Cape Ann and here around Hingham, Massachusetts, being shown in green. Over the next decade. Uh, this is defoliation, so it became a major defoliator, just like gypsy moth. So these are large acreage that were being defoliated down in southeast Massachusetts into Rhode Island, Martha Vineyard, and Cape Cod. We also put the pheromone traps along Route 2 uh, uh, to monitor the westward spread of winter moth. And so this shows that in 2007, winter moth was 
about about as far west as Concord, Massachusetts, and uh, all all the rest with Bruce Mangrum. But two years later, winter moth had spread further west all the way to Pittsburgh, so it, it was moving west fairly rapidly as well. Then the next thing that happened was in in 2012. Suddenly, our colleagues in Maine reported a huge winter moth outbreak there. So we had shown them there was winter moth back in 2006, but um, they'd never had a problem with winter moth, and but suddenly they do. With almost surely a global warming phenomenon, the Gulf of Maine, the, the water temperatures in the Gulf of Maine have been warming rapidly, and many of my colleagues who work on maritime species have been documenting that, while it's also influencing temperatures on land. So suddenly the, it became, uh, uh, the, the forests in the, along the coast became amenable to winter moth outbreaks. And they've had severe defoliation all along that, that region, again, right along the coast. Okay, well, as I said before, I knew about a biocontrol success on winter moth in Nova Scotia. So I jumped on the project and used them the two people who helped pull it off for me, in particular, my, my long-term lab tech, Jeff Bettner, who lived in, who worked in my lab for 31 years and did much of this work. Um, um, and uh, I'll tell you about his work. And then Hannah Broadley is my recent graduate PhD student who now works down at the, at the Otis lab on Cape Cod. Um, who did her PhD thesis on, on this project. So winter moth has been introduced several times in North America uh, to Nova Scotia uh, sometime before 1950, maybe in the 1930s, where it became a huge problem and a major defoliator in the, by the 1950s. It was also introduced um, uh, into the Vancouver Island and the area around Vancouver in the 1970s, and a separate introduction um, to uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, which occurred even earlier. So there are actually four major introdu introductions. And my uh, postdoc, Jeremy Anderson, has recently shown that all of these represent independent introductions uh, from uh, Europe. So the winter moths in Nova Scotia do not match the winter moths in, 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 uh, here in New England. The New England introduction is a separate one and comes from a different part of Europe. So Jeremy has a paper in review on that topic. All right, so in these, uh, in both the Western and Western introductions were controlled, permanently controlled by the introduction of these two parasitoids. So parasitoid, this is a, the parasitic fly and a parasitic wasp, so this is albicons is a fly, agathon flaviolatum is the wasp, and all parasitoids make a living in a similar way they lay their eggs on or in the host, in this case, the host caterpillar, and the larval fly and larval wasp develop inside the caterpillar and kill it. So that's the whole idea. Bio and biological control is largely based on the introduction of these species. And um, so, and this just shows the image, the immature fly. So the, 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 um, Immature fly develops in waits until the winter moth finishes feeding. The winter moth drops to the ground and pupates, and then the fly takes off. So this shows the pupa of the fly inside the winter moth pupa. So we dissect, we collect the dissect these pu pupae in midsummer, and we find these 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 um these fly uh, pupae, and that's how we tell it's parasitized. This shows the wasp egg upon. Uh, the the adult abacom waiting to emerge. They they both overwinter as pupae, or as, and inside the winter moth pupae, and uh, emerge in the spring to attack a new generation of winter moth. So this shows the Nova Scotia story. This is Doug Embry, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, it, uh, introduced these, both these agents, the fly and the wasp into Nova Scotia, the fly in 1954 and the wasp in 1956. And um, the, the red line shows defoliation by winter moth. So as I showed in the earlier slide, this was a major defoliator. It was causing 50, 40%, 80%. It goes up and down every year due, due to a variety of factors, but it's a significant level of defoliator in these red oak stands in, over, in, in Nova Scotia during this whole decade. So they, they released the fly and the wasp and for several years, they, they saw had no recovery. There was maybe, I guess the first recovery was, was, was maybe in 1957, but negligible parasitism until 1959. Suddenly there was 10% parasitism. And um, then the, the, the fly took off and caused 
by 1961 was causing six about six 60 percent parasitism the, the wasp also took off so by 1962 they were both causing high levels of parasitism and winnemoth uh went to negligible densities in fact they couldn't collect any more data on parasitism because they couldn't collect any caterpillars so starting in 1962 winnemoth bottomed out and it remained at low density in virtually negligible densities in Nova Scotia oak forests ever since. That's, you know, that's what we wanted to achieve with biocontrol. The fly has a very interesting biology. We decided to work with the fly and not the wasp. And the reason is the, the, the fly represents a perfect biocontrol agent in that it's an absolute specialist. It attacks winter moth and nothing else. It will not, for example, check other kinds of inchworms here in, 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 or in, in any other Lepidoptera here in, in um, Massachusetts. So when I, when I tell people I'm releasing a fly, they immediately want to know, well, is the fly going to become a problem? And the answer is no, because because it specializes on winter moth. When the winter moth densities decline, the fly will control its own population. So both species do go to very low density. The fly has a very unusual biology for parasites. Instead of laying its, its egg on the host, it lays it on the leaf surface. So all these little black specks are fly eggs that are laid on the leaf surface, waiting for a winter moth larva to come along and eat it. And when the when it's consumed by a winter moth, it hatches inside inside the winter moth mouth parts, and the, the larva fly that goes to the salivary glands where it helps hangs out, waiting for the um, the caterpillar to finish feeding and drop to the ground to pupate, and then the fly takes off and kills the winter moth pupa. So that's the whole idea of these biocontrol agents. So to summarize the, the, the notion about uh, Cytinus albicans, it's a very effective at high winter moth densities because it's attracted to defoliated leaves and lays these small eggs on the forward surface. It's less effective at lower density because defoliation is not happening, so it has much more it has much more difficulty locating uh, winter moth hosts. It's a complete specialist. That makes it a perfect biocontrol agent because then it won't spread on to other, other non-target in, insects, moths and butterflies that we wanna, don't want to harm. The other aspect of the winter moth system that makes it different from gypsy moth or forest tent caterpillar or other major uh, forest lepidoptera is there are essentially no diseases playing a major role in this system. Gypsy moth, for example, has two major diseases that, uh, in particular, a virus disease that comes in at very high density and causes the collapse of outbreak population. Winter moth has such a uh, virus. We published a paper on that, but it never amounts to much. It never causes more than about 5% mortality. So it, it doesn't really play a major role in the, in the population dynamics uh, of this species. So that's why the outbreaks just persist indefinitely until something comes along like Tidesians albicans. So that's what we attempted to achieve. Okay, so where do you, how do you collect the fly? Well, the way you do that is you go to the areas where the fly is established and you collect the late instar larvae, the larvae just before they poop it, and some of them will have the fly inside them. So we, we first went to Nova Scotia. That was the obvious place. This is Doug Embry, and he was the guy who did the, the, the successful uh, con implement introduction of the fly in the 1950s. So when we went in 2005, you can, he was, you can imagine he was an elderly gentleman. But we had great fun for four days hearing all his stories. And this is Brenda Whitehead, my, my, my graduate student, my first graduate student on this system. And we, we all worked hard for four days. And because winter moth is such low density in Nova Scotia, they're hard to collect. So after four days work, we had 200 winter moths and only about 5% of them uh, were, were infested. So that's just not enough. We came home with a handful of flies. It can, you cannot do biocontrol with small numbers of natural enemies. You've got to release them by the hundreds or the thousands. And because, why is that? Because if you release these flies here in Massachusetts, if there's just a handful, they'll, they'll, you release them in nature, they fly off who knows how far and attack winter moths. But when they uh, emerge the following spring to find mates, there aren't any mates because they're way too sparse and so they, they promptly go extinct. You got to do these projects by the hundreds, if not the thousands. Well, luckily, we had another colleague in, in, in Canada over in Vancouver Island. This is Emery Otkos who had been studying winter moth and Cytidus and uh, was introduced to Vancouver Island to control winter moth. And again, it was a success. But for whatever reasons we don't know, 
that the Winnemot densities have remained much higher there. So even though they're not causing major defoliation, you can see there's a little bit of tattering on these leaves. Uh, there's, you can collect the caterpillars by the thousands. So that's what we did. My, my lab tech, G. Jeff Bettner, went to uh, uh, Vancouver Island for seven straight years. And uh, we hired this crew of people who um, um, spent weeks after several, about six weeks, collecting Winnemot caterpillars. So they would beat the foliage and the caterpillars would come raining down and they would collect all the caterpillars, you know, you know several thousand a day. Um, and this is Jeff's motel room where he was rearing the caterpillars. So each one of these buckets has about 500 caterpillars. And he would spend all evening giving them fresh foliage. And there's peat moss down here where they pupate. So he would come home with about, um, you know, 120,000 pupae at the end of the end of six weeks. And we would take them down to the Otis Air Base USDA lab where they have a quarantine facility because we had a permit. We, you get a permit these days to do this kind of operation because it needs, you can't just be re randomly releasing uh, biocontrol agents collecting around the world. You need to make sure that you're not releasing something that's going to be da damaging. And so we kept them in the quarantine lab and this shows a fly. It looks superficially like a house fly, but it's, it's, it's not a house fly. So here in, in the, so we, we collect them in May and June, bring them back into the quarantine lab, rear them through the pupil stage, um, all through the fall and winter. And then in April, one year, almost one year later, we bring them out as adults. So we give me hummingbird food. You know, we take care of these little flies because they're very precious. And this shows our first release. In 2005, we released 225 flies at a single site in Hingham, Massachusetts. You can see all this, this was a big media event. It was on TV and everything, because by that time, Winnemouth was causing serious damage all across Eastern Massachusetts. So slowly but surely, we learned how to collect more flies. And uh, so by, the, you know, by 2015, we, we had we released 2,684 flies at 10 new sites. So every year we'd add new sites to the to the uh, to the system and gradually just filled in the map with uh, um, release sites, which I'll show you in a second. So then the next step is to verify whether we have successfully established the flies. So at all of these release sites, um, we would go back and check. Well, the next year, the following year, we would collect caterpillars and see if any of them had the fly inside them. So this this little gra video shows how we do the collecting. So we beat the, bu the bushes, so to speak. This is your apple trees, which have winter moth caterpillars on them, so that the caterpillars come raining down. And a good and a good on a good uh, population, you might start get several hundred caterpillars in an operation like that, and we then rear them out. So over the, the, the 15 year period that we did this, we have now established a fly at 44 sites. From X. So we just started our work here in, in Southeast Massachusetts and in, in, in Eastern Massachusetts and slowly expanded up along the coast of Maine and down into Connecticut and Rhode Island. So the orange circles show where we have successfully recovered and established a fly, but um, it sometimes takes several years for for it to show up, even though we released it. So these are areas where we have not yet recovered the fly as of 2018. And the yellow circles show them where we had, where we had, had new recoveries in 2018. So as of 2020, we have uh, 44 release sites representing all of the areas where you have outbreak populations of winter moth and have established the fly at 41 sites. So we felt very good about that. Um, this is a study we did in Wellesley in 2015. Wellesley was one of the first places where we recovered significant numbers of flies. And so the, these little uh, circles, we put out transects extending in six directions. Each one of these points is about a kilometer apart. So we're going 10 kilometers in different directions into Boston and into Framingham. Um, and the color circles indicate where where we had recovered the fly, the white circles where we had no recovery. So you can see between 2015 and 2016, there was significant spread of the fly all across the western suburbs of Boston from this release point in Wellesley. And the numbers in the circle indicate percent parasitism. So we had very high parasitism here and just a much lower parasitism. 
elsewhere, but the fly is rapidly spreading over this time period all over the western suburbs of Boston and doing so elsewhere as well. So then the uh, next question that we wanted to ask, and this is Hannah Broadley, my, my graduate student who now works at Otis Air Base. Um, and we do in my lab in my lab we do the DNA analyses and thanks to Jeremy Anderson largely who introduced this Jeremy and also Roger Gwiazdowski who introduced these techniques to us because we're ecologists we're not molecular biologists anyway Hannah learned how to do this extract the DNA sequence the mitochondrial DNA and then she can answer a specific question is the cydenus that we recovered in Massachusetts identical to the cydenus that we collected in British Columbia and released in Massachusetts. Because after all, there's a very similar fly that attacks blue spanworm. Maybe the fly just moved over from blue spanworm. Well, this is the answer. The, um, the sequence tell the differences. So the ones in, in blue are the ones we collected from blue spanworm, and they're a little different. These are evolutionary trees, the molecular uh, taxonomists used to tell the differences between genetic sequences. So the, the ones recovered from blue spanworm were a little different from the ones we we collected in British Columbia and recovered in Massachusetts or recovered or collected in Nova Scotia. So the ones in Nova Scotia were taken to British Columbia and they originally came from, from um, the Cytina Alpacon collected in Germany. They, they went from Germany to Nova Scotia to British Columbia and now to Massachusetts and they're all identical. So this shows that indeed what we, what we recovered in Massachusetts was identical to what we released which originally came from Germany, but via Nova Scotia and British Columbia. We collected them in British Columbia, Vancouver Island. Okay, so the last question we want to ask is, has now that Cydenus has become very widely established, is it in fact lowering winter moth density? So here it shows the Nova Scotia that no, these, these parasites, not that we didn't release the wasp because it's, it's, it's a generalist. We didn't, it's, you know, we stayed away from the wasp because we don't know anything about its, its host range. We're not even sure it represents is it, it's a single species. That's why we focus on the fly. So we we took a chance that the fly itself would reduce the population, and indeed it did has done exactly that. So again, the red line represents winter moth, and these are this is not defoliation. These are densities of pupae per meter. We put out these little collectors underneath the trees to estimate the numbers of pupae uh, borrowing into the soil and. Uh, so, you know, and, and before we established the fly, we had 200, 400, uh, you know, uh, several hundred pupae per square meter. That's a square yard. Uh, so, uh, that's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of caterpillars, a lot of pupae. And the, the blue that we started to release the fly shown, shown here. And just in Nova Scotia, there were several years, in many cases, six years in Hingham, and it took six years to get the first recovery. Um, and why is that? Well, the, as I think I said this before, it takes, several years for the fly to build up enough in each site you know we're releasing a few thousand flies at each one of these sites um and the next year there might be ten thousand and the next year the next there might be fifty thousand but in any one of these sites in in any hectare or any acre because there's a hundred thousand caterpillars per tree that's like 10 million winter moths at any acre it, it, it takes several years because both species have one generation a year for the flies to catch up to the millions of winter moths that exist at that site but when it finally kicks off, it, it, it has knocked the densities down to negligible levels at all of these sites. And that's, so this is Southeast Massachusetts. That's the first success that happened in Wellesley, which happened earlier. So the densities in Wellesley have been down at low density ever um, since 2012. I mean, even at low density, it's going to fluctuate up and down a bit, but it, there's no, no, no detectable foliation happening in Wellesley anymore. And that's true and now at all of these sites. Yarmouth and Falmouth are down in Cape Cod. So this is the defoliation in Massachusetts, which is the um, the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation does an overfly of Massachusetts mapping defoliation, showing those I mapped show those maps earlier. So we had, uh, you know, these are hectares defoliator. A hectare is, is 2.4 uh, acres. So you know, we had 35,000, that's over 80,000, 90,000 acres defoliated in this year. So we had large amounts of defoliation, just like it happened in Nova Scotia. It goes up and down, just like it did there. But starting in 2016, defoliation completely disappeared. It's been at zero ever since. So we've completely uh, repeated the, the big success in Nova Scotia. So we've converted Windermoth to a non-pest status. 
And this, unlike the other projects I work on with hemlock woolly adulterant and emerald ash borer, which are national programs, this was done by my lab alone. So I feel very good about what we achieved. And so the last thing I want to ask is, well, now we've reduced the densities seemingly on a permanent basis. Will Sizemus regulate the low density population of winter moth that now exists in eastern Massachusetts? The answer is probably not, for the following reason. When it, Sizemus albicon is a high density space specialist, as I said before, it seeks defoliated leaves and it becomes less, less effective at, when the densities are down. So, as I said, when we went to Nova Scotia, we collected uh, you know, with great difficulty, a few 200 winter moth caterpillars, and only 5% of them. And that's true in other studies in Nova Scotia. The, the parasitism drops way off. And a really fantastic work done by Jens Rollins out at University of British Columbia showed that uh, on Vancouver Island, once the fly knocks the population down, it's soil predators. There's a variety of soil predators that regulate the, the densities of winter moth. So we wanted to get a handle on that. This, and this was the PhD dissertation done by Hannah Broadley. Um, and she studied all these predators. There's a whole suite of predators, uh, several, you know, 29 species of crabbed beetles. These are all beetles uh, that live and feed in the soil and they consume whatever insect prey they find, including winter moth pupae, as, as do a couple of shrew species. And Hannah discovered this, this, this parasitoid. This parasitoid is causing significant parasitoid. This is this parasitoid, we got an ID, but it turned out to be with her DNA studies, her DNA skills is actually, uh, it consists of, of a two cryptic species that, are, that one of which has not never been described before, it's new to science. Anyway, so what Hannon did was collect all these winter moth pupae. So the winter moth pupae, we were collecting them by the tens of thousands for these, for this who assess parasitism. Like in that study I was studying Wellesley, well, that year we collected 75,000 caterpillars and reared them to the pupae stage and dissected them all. But here are the, the, little, the little cocoons in the, the pupae make. So Hannah took these cocoons and, and glued them with beeswax to burlap strap and put them out all, all across the landscape in eastern Massachusetts. So over a period of, uh, I think it was four years, she deployed 14,500 winter moth pupae, some of which had cydenas. And I won't tell you all of the stories that she wrote, but the basic idea is to, to assess whether they So you go back three weeks later and um, collect the pupae, you collect the burlap, you'd use the burlap to find the pupae, otherwise you'd never find them, and determine how many of them had been eaten by predators or whether they had parasites inside them. So we have a very large community of predators, as I said before. And so, so one of her studies was to, was to put out pupae in these mesh cages to keep out predators of different sizes. So she compared uh, sites where there was no cages to sites with cages of, of, of different mesh sizes. So these are half inch mesh, this is a quarter inch mesh. And as you as you in, as you reduce them the, the the mesh size, you're excluding more and more predators. And as a consequence, you, the late levels of predation were were much lower. So you see, we had 70% more predation with, without mesh when, when everything was present, larger beetles and, and food. But as you exclude them, the predation rates drop off. But we're talking about high levels of predation. Up to 90% of the pupae are eaten by predators. So a predator will regulate the density of its prey if and only if the percent mortality is um, uh, causes increases with pr predator density. And so the, the idea here is the equilibrium point uh, will, will be achieved when, when um, the death rate caused by the predators or the other natural enemies balances the birth rate. So the birth, each female lays uh, about 200 eggs, that's 100, fe 100 female eggs. So you gotta have about 99% mortality for the population to achieve this balance point where each female replaces herself just once. So over here, the, the birth rate is increasing, over here, the, over here, the, the, the population is increasing, the birth rate exceeds the death rate. So the equilibrium point where each female replaces her once occurs here. The whole idea of a biocontrol agent is to introduce these predators so we reach this equilibrium point well, well lower than, than defoliation. If the death rate does not increase, eventually the, the system will equilibrate, but that will be because there's no more foliage left. And that's, so the birth rate will decline then if there's no more foliage left. But that's we want to achieve it at a much lower rate. 
or less than lower density. So this is the density of the prey and the per capita, the, 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 the number of uh, eaten per, per capita. So what Hannah showed was that in fact, we have this density dependent mortality. As the density shown here increases, the, uh, the, the, the predation rates increase. And they now match very similar, but it's both the densities uh, and the, the predation rates, the, the, the increasing predation rates match the, study, the famous studies done by Barling, Gradwell, and Oxford. We have similar densities and a similar response to predators. So the the, the answer is that uh, the, the predators of, of, of winter moth uh, will regulate the population provided the density is, lower, is low enough. There's other studies in Europe where you can reach a saturation point where the predators can't keep up and the system is not regulated by predators, but if the density is low enough, thanks to the the uh, as the density increases, the predation rates will increase and the system will balance out and remain at low density. I mean, this is a situation that applies to forest insects. Or in, We have thousands of species of, 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 uh, of foliage feeding insects uh, here in our forest, and all of them are regulated by natural enemies. Almost none of them become defoliators, most of our defoliators are things that, that came here from elsewhere, like winter moth and gypsy moth, that escaped the natural enemies to keep them in check from when they came out. That's the whole idea of biological control. It's to reunite these species with their natural enemies. But we need the help of the nat naturally occurring predators in this case to achieve this, this, this fact. So it shows that the impact of a biocontrol agent cannot be understood and thus we account for all the other mortality agents acting in the system. <clears throat> it's not enough to simply document the, the decline of the population and the percent powers of them. You gotta try and understand all the, all the other mortality agents and together they, they bring the system into balance. This kind of study is almost never done because it's hard to do. It takes a lot of sanity, but we have tried to do that with this system. So to summarize where my, my talk, we have now established Cygenus at 41 of 44 release. Uh, sites from Southeast Connecticut to Central Coastal Maine, um, and it has spread across all of the outbreak areas of of uh, well, well, the Northeastern United States. Um, parasitism has increased at all of our long-term study sites, and defoliation by winter moth is no longer detectable anywhere. So we've been converted <clears throat> to a non-pest, and we now believe the low-density problems will stay that way by these native predators and parasitoids. There's a huge number of collaborators. I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm running along on time here, so I won't go through all these people. Um, but none of this would have been possible without many collaborators in the USDA, the Canadian Forest Service, these are the people who collected the caterpillars on Vancouver Island, many Dick Reardon and um, Ron Weeks were, were provided funding for this work. We have major collaborators, Charlene Donahue in Maine, Heather Faubert, um, many collaborators here in, the, in Massachusetts. So none of this would have been possible without all of these people helping out. And first of all, my lab, I mean, I love people in my lab. I mean, none of this work would be possible without the fine work that they do. So oh, now, ex excellent, Joe. Thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation and uh, awesome job. <laughs>